Today we wrap up the second major section of the book of Micah. Let's turn there in our Bibles if you have them. Micah chapter 5. The first section of Micah started in chapter 1 and went all the way through chapter 2. And the section, second section started at the beginning of chapter 3. And it goes through the end of chapter 5. And next week we'll start the, the last section of Micah. Uh, which takes us through the end of the book. So now's a pretty good time, I think, to talk about some overarching themes, to catch up a little bit, to see what Micah's all about. We've, we've been constantly hitting key ideas about God. We learn in this book, he is Lord over all the earth. That's one of Micah's favorite refrains about the Lord. He sees all things, even the sins of powerful people, against the powerless. He is Lord over the nations, even the nations that would invade Israel. And he brings justice to the world. We learn that God is just. And he specifically exercises judgment over his people. And we learn that he is merciful, that he'll judge his people, but restore them to relationship with him. He is faithful He keeps his promises, but he keeps them according to his justice and mercy, meaning he doesn't let sin slide by, but he also doesn't let his people be destroyed. He's faithful. He is good. We've learned a lot about God in this little book, haven't we? But we've also learned a lot about us. Human beings, unlike God, are not very just. We are not very merciful. And most significantly for this week, we're not very faithful. A pervasive sin in the book of Micah, besides the oppression and injustice that keeps jumping out at us, is the sin of idolatry. The northern kingdom of Israel is kicked out of their land for idolatry. They worshipped other gods, broke the covenant. So far in In the book, the southern kingdom of Judah has been rebuked. They've been rebuked strongly, but mostly because of their oppression against the poor and the failings of the rulers and the corruption of the prophets and the priests and an over-reliance on their military might. They haven't been explicitly rebuked for worshiping other gods. Except that's not really true. Micah has been pointing out their idolatry all along, hasn't he? And in our text this week, it's made abundantly clear. So let's stand and read Micah 5, 7 through 15 together. Micah 5, 7 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, Like showers on the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations, in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which, when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. In that day declares the Lord... I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots and I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds and I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes and I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands and I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities and in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. Please be seated, and let's pray. Lord, we humble ourselves before you now. We pray for clarity, the ability to understand your word. We trust you, and we know you have good things for us here, so we submit ourselves to you now pray that you would speak to us by your spirit, and we pray that you would mold us to it. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. So these verses finish up Micah 5, right? And they come right behind God's third response to Judah's crisis of invasion. You remember that? The beginning of chapter 5 was God's third response to the problem, the crisis of invasion. He gave them three. The first response to the crisis of Assyria invading Judah was that they would be deported. They would lose their land, but not from Assyria, from Babylon. They would be deported by Babylon out of their land. The second response was that Assyria would be pushed out of Judah and they'd survive the immediate crisis. That was good news. The third response is that God would provide the Davidic king who would rule in authority and in the strength of the Lord. Three responses to the crisis of invasion. 7 through 15 here close up an even longer portion of the book of Micah that's focused specifically on God's promises, starting all the way back in chapter 4. What we read today are more promises of God, even if they don't always sound good. These are promises that God makes to build up his people. So first, in verses 7 through 19, they, they address the future remnant. The remnant of Jacob is mentioned twice in these verses. The remnant of Jacob was the remaining group of people that belonged to the nation of Judah and some of Israel that survived the exiles of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. They had stayed faithful to the Lord. This was the remnant. So we're looking into the future here. This promise has to do with the future. Micah tells us that they will be in the midst of many peoples. And so immediately things feel cramped. Right? The, nation, the nations, in comparison, are huge. When we look at the small remnant left over from Judah and Israel, and they're locked in by four nations on every side. And so this is a reminder of what's to come these first few phrases, that exile is coming. The nation of Judah would be taken out of the land, reduced in population, and surrounded by pagan enemies. Nevertheless, we're told that they will be like dew from the Lord, like showers of the grass, which delay not for a man, nor wait for the children of man. So Micah gives the people a comforting picture here of their future role amongst the nations, even though it will be cramped, They will be exiled. They will be small. They'll be like dew, a much needed dew, like a refreshing summer rain for the nations who conquered them. A thick morning dew was a blessing from the Lord in the minds of the people of Judah, where it rarely rained through the summer months. So for that dew to come was a blessing. It was God providing for their crops. But a thick layer of dew in the morning wasn't all that God calls them here. He he says there'll be a rain. So above and beyond what they expect from the Lord, that's what they'll be to the nations that surround them. In our culture, rain is often a symbol of sadness or tragedy. But in the land of Israel, rain was a major blessing for a whole society and economy dependent upon agriculture. For rain to come was a big deal, especially in the summer. And that's what Israel, the the remnant, would be for these nations. They would be a mediator of divine blessing from the Lord to the nations. So they would bring life and renewal and provision to the nations they were exiled to, just as dew and rain stood for life and renewal and provision. And we see this play out in the scriptures, in the exile. We don't have to look much further than the book of Daniel. In the beginning of the book, Daniel and all of his friends are successful. The young Israelite men in Babylon are a blessing to the rulers of Babylon. Daniel, in particular, has a major beneficial impact on the empire of Babylon and Persia later on. And he has a special role as God's prophet to those kings. So Daniel's just one example. God truly did make the remnant to be a blessing to their captors. But dew and rain aren't the only metaphors we find in these verses. Look again at verse 8. The remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples. 
like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes down, when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Once again, we're, we're told that the remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples, so the cramped feeling is back. But this time, God will make them like a lion, the king of the forest. And he tears apart and he tramples down flocks of sheep and goats, like a young lion in the midst of sheep. So gone is the image of the remnant as a blessing, and now they rise as instruments of God's judgment. So the tables have turned. The humiliated people of God will rise and tear apart their enemies like a hungry young lion surrounded by delicious sheep. And there will be none to save them. Verse 9 pictures the remnant as victors in battle. Judah has a weak, limp hand as it goes into exile, but their hand will be lifted up against their adversaries, and their enemies will be cut off, put to an end. It's a striking picture of holy war and and God's arm of judgment. The remnant would rise and execute that judgment, would be the arm of the Lord against God's enemies. And God certainly did use his exiled remnant as an instrument of judgment. And once again, Daniel's a great example. In Daniel chapters 4 and 5, the prophet pronounces judgment against Babylon's kings, two different ones. But another great example of this is the book of Esther. One man, Haman, wanted to wipe out all the Jewish peoples in the Persian Empire, but God raised up an instrument of judgment against him and against the nation of Persia in the person of Esther. But does the the remnant ever really tear apart the empire of Persia? No, not really. In fact, Persia sends back the remnant with a blessing, King Cyrus. Which means we're looking at a prophecy that's only partially been fulfilled. But more on that in a second. Micah brings together two of the primary functions of Israel, the people of God, as they relate to the world. They're supposed to be a blessing, like a dew and a summer rain. But they're also supposed to be instruments of God's justice. And this is still the case today. The first function of the people of God throughout time is to be a blessing. And that's still true. That's true for us. We're supposed to be a blessing, like a summer dew and rain for our community. In in Matthew 5, you'll recall Jesus gave us two metaphors for the church in the world, salt and light. As the salt of the world, we stave off rot and we make the world taste better. We fight to get rid of the things in the world that bring corruption and death. And we actively work to make our communities more righteous, more peaceful, more joyful. And we should see those things. We, individually here and corporately as Lake Morning Community Church, should see those things as imperatives. The work of being the salt of the world applies to every Christian. Making the world more righteous more peaceful, brings glory to the Lord. And by improving our surroundings, we are presented with countless opportunities to share the gospel, to win people for Christ. We should want to be a much-needed morning dew, a welcome summer rain for our community. Right? Right? And we can do this. And we can do this corporately in various ways as we serve the community. And we can do this individually as we seek to be a blessing to our families and to our co-workers and to our actual neighbors we live next to but forget their names often. So what can you do here or individually? How can you be a blessing to your surroundings? And we should pray for the Holy Spirit to motivate us to love our neighbors and to love the lost. The other function of the people of God that Micah emphasizes here is 
at first seems to be a contradiction to the first. How can the people of God be both an instrument of divine blessing and an instrument of divine judgment? But it's actually not a contradiction. As the Lord has revealed himself both in scripture and in creation, all people are accountable to him. And we have specifically been given the message of the gospel. There were times when the nation of Israel was a blessing to the surrounding nations, like the rule of King Solomon. And there were times when Israel was an instrument of God's judgment against wicked people, like in the conquest of Canaan. And today, the church is a mediator of God's blessing and God's judgment to the world in the message of the gospel. The gospel is a message of hope and salvation for all who believe. But for those who hear and do not believe, they are left without excuse. God has provided time. He's provided us time to go to the lost and for the lost to respond to the gospel in faith. But if they fail to do so, then they will face his judgment. I mentioned that verses 8 and 9 were partially fulfilled during the time of the exile. But they'll have greater fulfillment when the Lion of Judah comes, waging war against his enemies and making all things new. And the church, we, will participate in that. And as Christ's hand is lifted up over the devil and his demons, we will be lifted up as well. The ultimate victory pictured here comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross and in the future. And Jesus is the greatest example of this dual functionality. He is the ultimate blessing for all people. He went to the cross and died for your sin. He provided the necessary sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. But he's also the ultimate judgment of God on his enemies. Revelation 19, 11 through 16 gives us a stunning picture of Jesus as conquering king. I'd encourage you to incorporate that into your devotions to be reminded of both parts of who Jesus is to the people of the world. Again, Revelation 19, 11 through 16. We're told that Jesus, when he comes, will rule with an iron rod and tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. The one who died on the cross will tread God's enemies. It's a startling picture. Jesus is both mediator of divine blessing and mediator of divine judgment. And we worship him today. Amen? Amen. We worship him as God. And we look forward to the day when he makes all things new. We look forward to the day when he does bring that righteous judgment upon the world. And even greater blessing for his people. But that's the future. Second, Micah deals with God's promises about the present problem. Before heading to exile and becoming the blessed remnant, the morning dew and the young lion, the people of Judah would have to undergo God's purification. You see, just like the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah had given themselves over to idolatry. Verses 10 through 15 outlines all the ways they had done this through the years. Micah gives us three main ways Judah had committed idolatry, and each of them had to do with the the issue of syncretism. Syncretism. So let's talk about syncretism for a second. Religious syncretism is when one religion adopts certain beliefs and practices from another, and in so doing corrupts the original religion with the added beliefs. So it's an unholy blending of religious beliefs and practices. Often we think of idolatry in the Old Testament as people just walking away from the worship of the one true God, giving the worship of God up in the temple and just going to these other gods, these new religions even. 
But more commonly, idolatry in the Old Testament is a result of syncretism. So let's think back to the northern kingdom of Israel. Their original sin, you might say, was when their first king, Jeroboam, set up golden calves in Dan and Bethel. We talked about this a little bit in the very first sermon in the book of Micah. The golden calves that Jeroboam set up were supposed to, were supposed to represent the God of Israel. But they were graven images. Right? That the second commandment found in the law explicitly condemned and forbid. But they were supposed to be images of Yahweh, just like Aaron set up in the desert. When the people of Israel came out of Egypt, Moses went up the mountain. Aaron missed him. He thought he was gone too long. And created a statue. And the statue wasn't supposed to be another god. It was supposed to be Yahweh. Aaron said, this is the god that delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians. That's the case with Jeroboam in the northern kingdom. He set up two of them in the far north in his kingdom and on the southern border in Dan and Bethel. Every other religion in his area was, were represented their gods with images. So Jeroboam did the same. And so this resulted in the, in the northern kingdom, the people of the northern kingdom, worshiping God incorrectly. Which led them to bring other idolatrous aspects into their worship. They introduced other gods into the mix. And they built for themselves a pantheon in which the God of Israel was the top God. So that's syncretism. And the southern kingdom did it too. And here in Micah 5, Micah outlines three ways the kingdom of Judah strayed from correct worship. First, they had placed their confidence and faith in their military might. Second, through div divination and witchcraft. And third, by bringing in other gods in their worship of Yahweh. So as we walk through each of these sins, notice first how it's the Lord who cuts them away from his people. Just like the beginning of chapter 4 where it's all God acting, so it is here wrapping up this section. It's a callback. This is the action of God in the act of purifying and sanctifying his people. Verse 10 and 11, look, look at that again. And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you, and I will destroy your chariots, and I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. The first thing that Judah had placed their faith in other than the Lord was their military might, horses, chariots, strongholds. They trusted in them, in their horses and their chariots to fight for them and for their strong cities to protect them when they should have trusted the Lord to fight for them and protect them. Hezekiah, the good king, Hezekiah, made treaties with nations like Egypt who provided these things for the kingdom of Judah. And apparently, he put way too much faith in that military. And because the king placed his trust in the military, so did the people. Where the king goes, the people go. And it's listed here first because it's first in their heart. But Hezekiah should have taken up the attitude toward chariots and horses that his ancestor David had taken up. In Psalm 20, verse 7, King David says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Isaiah speaks to the fact that Judah had placed their trust in the strength of their cities. In chapter 2 of Isaiah, in verse 15, where, where God says he will one day bring himself against every high tower and against every fortified wall. And of course, their military might was an import from other countries. That's an important note here. They trusted in something they received from pagan nations over the promises of the Lord. And if we look back to chapter 1, we can read again of the invasion of Assyria against Judah and the many fortified cities Micah lists that would fall in the wake of that army. 
Lachish, for instance, a city well known for its military presence and its many chariots, would only use those chariots for escape. The nation of Judah made the mistake of placing their trust and faith in their own strength. That was their first idol, their own strength. We can do that too. That's a pretty easy mistake to make. How often do we fail to trust in God for our lives until it's too late? Because we've trusted too much in ourselves. Do we hold on to things that we should trust him with? Do we trust in our own strength to solve our problems? The church can easily slip into this kind of thinking. I'm talking about all of us, the church. We can put so much emphasis in trying to solve our own problems with our own resources that we forget that all blessing and provision comes from the Lord. The church will be victorious in Jesus Christ alone, not in her own strength. Judah had placed their faith in their military might, in their many chariots, in their many horses. But they also placed their faith in divination. And God would purify them from that as well. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand. And you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. Divination and witchcraft were explicitly condemned in both Exodus and Leviticus. Exodus 22.18 says, You shall not permit a sorceress to live. <clears throat> and Leviticus 19.26 says, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. But from the beginning of time, people have tried to find a way to gain control over nature. They've tried to see what was coming next. And the language of Micah here makes reference to some kind of an attempt to get control, and to see the future. But any so-called success in this area is simple paganism. It's not actual magic. And paganism, you'll recall, is the attempt to gain control over nature, to convince gods to work on your behalf. God condemns sorceries, witchcraft, fortune-telling, because at their core, they are an assertion that man can gain control over things apart from God. Their own lives, creation itself, time, whatever it might be. Occultism is an attempt to do something, to change or manipulate the world through our own wisdom and knowledge, through our own cleverness. Judah's first idol, their military might, was similar. They trusted their own strength. And in the same way, they trusted their own knowledge and their black magic. And these occult practices and fortune-telling activities were more outside imports that were brought into the covenant community. And I, Isaiah says as much in Isaiah 2, 6. He says, for you have rejected your people, talking about God. You have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of the things from the east and fortune tellers like the Philistines. So this is another example of syncretism. Israel and Judah conforming to the world and adopting outside religious practices. Now, it should go without saying that divination, witchcraft, attempting to be a sorcerer, fortune-telling, they're not things that the Bible says we should do. They're not things Bible-believing Christians should participate in as practices. Maybe that's obvious to us, but I think it's obvious because of what has replaced these things. Witchcraft has become its own religion, and it's intertwined with the neo-pagan movement, and it's super obvious. It's outside of Christianity, mostly. Fortune-telling and other similar practices, while we should definitely avoid them, have really become superstitious entertainment spectacles. But in the time of Israel, which is many cultures and many centuries removed from our world, they understood these practices as complementary to their worship of God as just another avenue to manipulate the world. So what has 
supplanted or replaced ancient witchcraft today in our attempts to manipulate the world around us? What have we placed our faith in? What have we syncretized with Christianity? Maybe a little too much. It's clear to me that modern science and technology are the greatest examples of man trying to manipulate creation today. Now, there's a lot of nuances here. Don't get me wrong. Science and technology are not bad things in and of themselves, like witchcraft and divination were. Far from it. They can help us do many wonderful things, including spread the gospel. But if they replace God in your worldview, or even worse and more insidious, if they make God smaller in your heart than what he really is, then they're no better than pagan sorceries. The danger comes when we trust in the creature rather than the creator. And there's a moment here to examine our hearts, I think. Do the different technologies we use make God smaller to us or less important? Do the different scientific theories that abound about the universe tempt us to think that there is no God? Are we tempted to make science a God itself? Bruce Waltke, a Bible scholar and commentator, was insightful when he said this about this passage. He said, Secular man more effectively manipulates life by his use of science than his ancestors did by magic. But not more than they can he secure eternal life for himself. As Christianity engages with scientific theories and discoveries and technology, we have to be cautious. We have to watch out for the temptation towards syncretism, getting rid of certain parts of Christianity to make room for these new discoveries. Our final authority for life and doctrine remains the word of God in all times. Amen? Amen. May the Lord protect us and purify us from any attempts to manipulate our world apart from him. And may we approach any technology or scientific discovery first from the foundation of Scripture. Verses 12, 13, and 14 of Micah 5 are all related to each other. Even though they talk about slightly different ways Judah has abandoned their God in their hearts. Verse 13 and 14 continues God's purifying action. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you. And you shall bow down no more to the works of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. So now we find direct reference to pagan idolatry. Carved images were representations of various gods or even references to good luck charms and things like that, which would connect verse 13 to verse 12. Pillars or sacred stones were a physical representation of the Canaanite god Baal. If you've been familiar with the Old Testament, you've heard that name, Baal. The stone pillars, it's a vulgar sexual image. That's how they represented Baal in their worship. Asherah images were similar, but they were made from wood. Sometimes the goddess Asherah was worshipped in groves of trees specifically planted for that purpose. She's a tree goddess. But if a forest couldn't be found for that worship, they would just take a tree, cut it into a pillar, and plant it right next to an altar of the Lord. The sad truth about this time in the history of God's people is that the worship of Yahweh one true God, became despicably mixed with Canaanite worship. Baal was a Canaanite God that had different variations. You could go to different regions in Canaan and find different Baals, just a name that means husband or sometimes Lord. Most typically, he was a storm God and was worshipped through sexual immorality, of course, in order to convince him to send rain on your crops. You'd go to his temple, you'd lie with a sacred prostitute, and he would send you rain. That's paganism. Convincing a god to do something for you. Jezebel introduced the worship of Asherah 
to the northern kingdom of Israel in 1 Kings 16. Like I said, Asherah was a tree goddess, goddess of fertility. Elijah pretty much put an end to the independent worship of Asherah in the north for a while. But over the years, she became intertwined with the worship of Yahweh. And fortunately, one of the worst syncretistic moves that Israel and Judah made was to claim that Asherah, this goddess of fertility, was married to Yahweh. That she was his consort. And that their son was Baal. This is syncretism to its core, you see. Not only were they worshiping other gods, but they made the one true God to be something, that he re- something different than what he revealed himself to be. So it, it even came about that the kings like after, after Hezekiah, the king after Hezekiah, Manasseh, planted Asherim, representations of Asherah, in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. It was truly despicable, horrible stuff. And so for, for God to promise that he would remove these false gods and images from Israel would be grace. It would be a good thing. The carved images, the pillars, the Asherah, all found in these verses can be summed up by the end of verse 13. The work of your hands. The Bible views the work and worship of idol worship with sharp realism. Listen to the words of Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. That last, that last verse is incredibly insightful. Those who make them become like them. The prophet Isaiah brilliantly, brilliantly dismantles the idea of idol worship in Isaiah 44. It's poignant and powerful. And it's worth quoting at length for you. So if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 44, 12 through 17, keep a finger in Michael, we'll be right back. This is really great stuff. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and makes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts, and it is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Isaiah points out the absurdity here in making idols and in idol worship. But human beings have worshipped images carved out of wood and crafted from metal since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. It's something that our heart wants to do. We're prone to worship things that we make. And that's still true today. Our careers, our material possessions, our cars, even our families can be idols. Our hearts are full of pride. And like these old idol worshipers, we trust in the things we can fashion for ourselves. We serve them with our time, talent, treasure. And so like military might and like divination, idol worship is all about trusting ourselves. We wrongly place our trust in things we can't, that can't really save us, can't really lead us. 
They have a mouth but do not speak. They come from the same stuff that we use to provide for ourselves. So when we live our lives for our jobs or for things or for things other than God, we're like the man in Isaiah 44 who takes the same tree for fuel for his fire and takes the other half to carve into an idol. It's absurd. When idolatry creeps into our hearts and into our lives, it's rarely because we've intentionally gone out of our way to worship other gods. Instead, it's a lot like what happened to Judah. Syncretism. We start to adopt certain practices of the world into our lives that pull our attention away from the Lord. Anything that replaces the call on your life to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself can become an idol. And we can start to marry these idols to our worship of the Lord, thinking they are good for us. So here are some examples. We can start to see the church like a business and a place to find clients. We can start to see other church members and Christians as only worth our time if they think like us politically. We can start to view musical worship or the sermon as entertainment. We can start to view acts of service toward other people as as a means to boost our ego, to boost our self-esteem. When we let our hearts stray into idolatry, we'll find out, like Judah found out, that they are no different than the nations. Verse 15 says, And in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. That's a warning. God does not let disobedience to his word and idolatry slide. The nations that do not worship God as the one true God, who worship their own works, they will be judged by God. The ESV translates this as execute vengeance, which is helpful, but it doesn't fully grasp the whole idea. It's more restorative than that. God reestablishes his rule here in verse 15. He pushes out all of these outside things, all of the things that cause syncretism, and he reestablishes his borders. He executes vengeance on the nations that invaded with all of their idols. All these people brought in idolatry and here God reestablishes his kingdom. He demands obedience to his word. And those who do not obey, who do not worship him as the only God, will find themselves on the wrong side of his vengeance. These kinds of warnings should bring us to a time of self-examination. So let's do that again. Let's examine our hearts. Look at our own lives. In what way have you been tempted to adopt the practices of the world in the worship of the Lord? Have you trusted in your own strength like Judah did with their military? Have you trusted in your own knowledge and your wisdom and intelligence like Judah did with their sorcery? Have you trusted in your own works like Judah did with their idols. Sometimes we need to experience God's purifying grace like the nation of Judah. Sometimes we need God to purge us from the things that distract us and tear us away from him. And like the remnant of Judah, God has promised us good things for the future. But also like the remnant of Judah, God has purposed this time until Christ returns or until you die to make us more like his son. We should desire that God would do that. We should desire that God would make us holy. Because the truth is, if we try to do that in our own strength, we'll only bring in outside stuff and make it worse. We need God's grace to help here, to kill our sin, to be more like Jesus. Amen? So let's pray and ask the Lord for that grace right now. Let's spend some time in personal reflection asking the Lord for that.
Lord, too often we trust in ourselves, our strength, our knowledge, or our works. We create idols too easily from things in our lives. Our money, our job, our, our kids even. Lord, anything that distracts us from you, we pray that you would open our eyes to. You would take away the idolatry of our hearts. That we would worship you truly and, and desire to worship you truly. To not bring anything in from the outside, from apart from your word. But to worship you as God and how you revealed yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.